gorgeous faces. Hello, everyone. It's nice to see you. I am so excited about our guest tonight. You will soon find out why. Um, I have got Paul Strickwerda here with us, and I wanted to get that out of the way very quickly before I completely forgot how to pronounce it properly. Um, as you guys know, we're recording the call. Please feel free to chat amongst yourselves as always. But if you do have any questions, it's very important that you type in all caps question beforehand, and I will bring them through to Paul. And remember our number one rule, which I never mentioned to the guests until the call started, so they can't run away. Um, any questions must be quirky questions. I don't want anything boring that I can find on an easy Google search because what's the point? We've got them everywhere else. So anything, you know, I love the superhero one, the candy one, things like that. Live it up, guys. Okay, so we've got Paul here. Paul is quite famous in the voiceover world. We were just having a quick chat um, before the call started about how I didn't realize that although we're in the same world, voiceover and audiobook narration, we're big tribes and a lot of people in the audiobook world don't really know everything about the voiceover world and vice versa. People are coming in fast as we speak. So basically, Paul has a blog called Nether Voice and Paul wrote a book. Um, I don't want to mangle the title. Um, it's about how to make money in your PJs. Correct. That's it. it making money in your PJs. It was the first book I read when I was trying to break into the business and terrified about money. And Paul was like, his book was like my Bible. His blog scared me to death, scared me to death. And Paul has said that he's, and I want to talk to him about it throughout this call, that he's had some awakenings and that his approach to his blog has changed recently. But I I had a realization reading back tonight that I was reading some of the posts that I read that scared me. I don't think it's so much that you've changed, but I think that I've changed now, years later. I think that we all get different messages at different times when we're ready for them. And Paul has been very candid about mindset and success, and he coaches voiceovers and and I think that we could all learn a lot from Paul's take on things. But first, I want to know how you ended up in America from <laughs> all the way across the world, Paul. Can you tell us a little bit about your background? And <laughs> I'm happy to do that. As you can hear from my weird accent, I'm not from the United States, not from the UK. I was born, raised and educated in the Netherlands. And uh, the reason I'm here is love. Love is what brought me here and love is what will keep me here. Did I you meet your love, wife over there or over here? I, I met her over here and I gave up my life in the Netherlands, moved everything in two suitcases in one plastic bag, <laughs> put all my belongings in there, everything that was worthwhile and I literally started over at the age of 38. It was a big adventure, but totally worth it. And now I am an American citizen. I'm also a Dutch citizen. And I still live in a town called Eastern Pennsylvania, which is about 16 blocks from New Jersey, next to the Delaware River. And I've been here for about 13 years, but I moved to the United States at the end of 1999, so the last century. <laughs> Can't believe how it. Did, how did you guys meet? Were you like out with friends and your eyes met across a crowded room or... Oh my gosh. Well, here's a good story for you. We met online through a dating website, Yahoo Personals. And this is how it happened. I wrote in my profile, I'm from the Netherlands. The Netherlands, if you've ever been there, is as flat as a pancake. No mountains whatsoever, a few hills. So I'm from the Netherlands and I do not ski. And my wife, who is the person who is now my wife, was looking for basically skiing buddy. So she was typing in look for a partner keyword ski and that's how she got to me the guy who did not ski <laughs> and uh, and um so she thought hmm this guy's from europe i like the way he sounds very interesting so we had our first date and 
we felt there was this immediate click, and uh, she said, uh, you know what, we've got to pick a restaurant for a first date. I have to admit something to you. I said, what? Tell me. She said, I'm a vegetarian. I said, so am I. I've been vegetarian since I was 17. She said, I've been a vegetarian since I was 17. So that was another click, and she said, you know what, Paul, if it's ever going to be something serious between you and me, there's one thing you need to do. You got to learn how to ski. So guess what we did on our second date? We went to the ski slopes of Blue Mountain, we rented skis. I had a two hour lesson and then the rest is history. I spent a great afternoon on the skiing slopes of Pennsylvania, which ended in a terrible face plant, but boy, did we have fun. And we're still skiing together. Do you in know fact, that it, what she said, the thing, isn't that funny that, you know, the saying, you, you might not get what you want, or maybe it's a song. Oh my God, I'm old. I'm forgetting things. You might not get what you want, but you get what you need. Yes, exactly. She wanted, a, she wanted specifically someone that learned how to ski, but she got the love of her life. Exactly. She wasn't looking for a life partner, but just so a skiing buddy. And she got more. The nice thing was that I had studied musicology back in the Netherlands, and she is a professional musician. In fact, in about 45 minutes, she'll probably start uh, teaching piano and flute again. So I don't know if you hear a piano or flute in the background. You know, that's my wife teaching. We'll it's have just background like, music. I know. And in the since the pandemic, our lives have become even more parallel because I already did all my work online. Now mm -hmm. she started teaching online 100% as well. So both of us run an online business. Both of us have been freelancers for most of our lives. Both of us love music. We eat, drink and breathe music. And that's, you know, some people think that because I'm this, this voiceover blogger and voiceover person that I eat, drink and breathe voiceovers all the time. I read about voiceovers all the time. Not at all. I find my main inspiration in music, playing music, listening to music, analyzing it, writing about it, talking about it, and going to concerts with my wife and uh, being the admiring person in the audience, looking at, using my opera binoculars, looking at her in the pit. It was phenomenal. It was wonderful. <laughs> but do you not find that that's, and I find that with narration as well, all the narrators I know are like, um, one guy does the, what, what's the thing when you're on the stilt? I can't remember the, I don't know what's wrong with my memory tonight. Lots on my mind, but he does that where, you know, the, the guy on the one stilt that's like 80 miles up in the air, he does yeah. that, he does that for the fun of it. Some yeah. other narrators do ukulele for the fun of it. You know, I think it's the other things we do that make us what we good at what we do. I, do you know what I mean? Otherwise you'd be a boring one dimensional. Absolutely. I totally agree with you. I was, I was, I was micro blogging about that the other day, because one of my hobbies is watching television. <laughs> Don't watch television for the commercials because everything we do is stream. But I think these have lots of TV shows and movies that I'm watching have enriched me as a person and as a voiceover. Yeah. And one of the things I was thinking about is this show that's popular at the time we're broadcasting this interview. It's Squid Game. It's a we're watching Korean that show. Are you watching that too? Yes. Man, oh my God. <laughs> and the thing is, you can watch it two ways in America. You can either do it, you sub it, or you can dub it. And everybody's complaining about the dubbed version because apparently it's not very good. But I never, ever watch dubbed content. I only watch it subbed. And why? Because it enriches me. Because in Europe, they're very big on, on subtitles. And from a very early age, my parents always had us kids watch TV from Britain, from France, from Italy, from Germany. Not because as kids we could understand what was being said, but because we, we familiarize ourselves with the accents. You get a word, you sounds. get an ear for the language, don't you? Absolutely. You're reading along. What better training is that? Yeah, Your subconscious exactly. is relaxed. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. And then you go to school and learn foreign languages and you feel that you already know a little bit because you've yeah. listened to it. And the great thing is also, you know, the Dutch love to travel because Holland is super small. So we have to go outside of our boundaries to explore the world. But when you go to a different country, you have the feeling that you already know it because you've seen the people yeah. you've learned about their customs and their culture. It's such a more, much more eye opening experience than watching something that's dubbed. You yeah. deprive yourself of a great experience. So that's a, you know, I often, because I'm still very much European in, in, in the bottom of my soul, that's one of the big differences, I think, between European talent and American talent, that we are much more used to different accents, different customs, different people, and it makes it a little bit easier to deal with people from all over the world as well. Because when 
I deal with clients in Germany. I can write to them in Germany. I can speak to them in German. I can thank them in German. That creates that instant connection, which you don't have when you just speak one language, English. And you change. Do you not find that you you become, I think you become a different, I think that's why travel is crucial. I mean, I lived in London for like 17 years and in London, you just get used to it. I mean, there's, you're not going to be ever in a room with anyone with the same accent ever. (laughs) And, and I love that. I love that. But you also, I don't have an ear for it anymore. I've, I've moved too much that I can't, I was telling someone the other day, I couldn't tell you if I'm watching a show that's American or English because I don't pay any attention. I'd have to literally stop and think, Right. you know, right, right. Yeah. Um, do, do you do accents? Well, can you do an American accent having lived over there? Oh my gosh. My, is it a question to me or is it a question that people ask you? Do, do, people want me to do a British accent. They assume, oh and I'm worse than I ever would have been. I cannot, I think I sound exactly like them. I've mm-hmm. been here too long. You lose. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You got to be immerse yourself in that culture, in that linguistic bubble yeah. that you're in. If you don't use it, you lose it. When I came to the United States, I had a very British accent because that's what Dutch school children not taught the Queen's English in school. And everybody thought I was from Britain. They thought I was so, you know, they thought I was very stuck up and posh and everything got me into trouble too. And one of the things I, I uh, started doing when I came to the United States is I could not legally work here, but I had to make a living because I came to the United States on a tourist visa. Mm. So what does one do? Well, one starts to waiter. Mm. So I, I lived in New Hope, Pennsylvania at that time, very posh. And uh, I had a game with the people whose tables I waited. I said, you know, if you can figure out by the end of your meal where I'm from based on my accent, I will pay you. F- I will pay for your dessert. And in all the years, but two, three years that I waited, only two times people took me up on it because they guessed it. Otherwise, they, they had no idea. They thought it usually was British. And I said, nope, not British, but it's European. Well, maybe Danish. Nope, not Danish. Because, you know, that's another thing that you miss. People are not familiar with the Dutch accent. Because when do you ever hear a Dutch speaker? When ever, when's the last time you saw a Dutch movie or a Dutch TV series? No, Nobody I was madly that. in love with a man from Stockholm, and as Americans, we tend to think <laughs> Stockholm, Netherlands. Next door. <laughs> yes, and Copenhagen is the capital of Holland. Yes, <laughs> I've had that too. That's horrible. It is. It is. But yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, but then again, my geography of the United States is terrible too, because it's, it's <laughs> huge. And so someone from a small country, we have no idea how vast the United States is and how yeah. diverse and how beautiful. I mean, that's one thing about I, I intensely love about this country, the diversity, the beauty of nature and the warmth of the people, the different accents, the silliness, the ridiculousness sometimes, <laughs> but also the creativity and, and you know, the welcoming heart that people always have wherever I go. I felt immediately at home and I still do, which is important because when you're an expat, you leave your life behind, your family and your friends, you find a new your do tribe, it's important that you have people in your life who make you feel at home. And I've always found the Americans very hospitable, very welcoming and very warm and very yeah. proud of where they live too. I mean, first thing that I noticed was all these flags out of side, side of the houses. People have their flags out for no reason. And I don't think have... when I was there, it was like 20 years ago. I'm not sure flags were a thing when I was there. Mm-hmm. I think that might be a newer thing. Yes. After 9-11, I think that was a big thing. Yeah. I was imagine me 1999 I came to the United States and I think 2001 was 9-11 and after that all these flags started showing up if you want to have a flag outside in Holland there has to be an official holiday otherwise you don't do it but here it's, it's all the time <laughs> it gives me a wonderful feeling really it makes me think I need to go back and visit more often it's been a long okay so how yes. did you get into voiceover oh. <laughs> well I'm a son of a minister so um, language is always very important in a house. And my mom taught me to read when I was very early. I was like four or five years and I could read fluently. Wow. And one of the things that she signed up, signed me up for was at the local library where they had a read aloud contest. There was a, a chapter of a book that was required reading. And um, so about six or seven other kids 
were brought up and um, they all read in front of grown-ups and at the end they uh, determined a winner and guess what i was the winner and that was my very first um, narration job i guess i bet that imprinted on you did that imprint yes, on you yes, yes. yeah because what yeah. i noticed was that people were responding to what i said and i could also compare myself to other people and that's one of the things we lack as as voiceovers because when we send out editions and there are a hundred other people who send out the same or use the same script for the same audition we have no idea what the competition sounds like but at that time when i was that young i could hear all the other kids stumble and fumble and they were not good and i could read fluently and without any mistakes and to me that was normal <laughs> How old were to you? To them, it was special. I was six, seven years old. I said six years old, and they're no good. So I got this. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that's one of the things I tell my students as well. You know, what's normal to you is really special to other people. And sometimes you need others to tell you what's so special about you because for you it's normal and you have no idea. For you, oh, I'm just myself. I just do what I always do. No, you sound, there's nobody who sounds like you. That's one of the things when I came to the States too. I often tell this story about uh, my first uh, agent that I landed, Mike Lemon, at Mike Lemon Casting in Philadelphia. I was at this casting call. There were 600 other people, and they were doing all kinds of things because Mike Lemon is the big caster for the movies of M. Night Shyamalan. Oh, wow. Uh, and um, so I was the only person doing voiceovers. The rest always all wanted to be on-screen actors and dancers and singers. And so did you the, never, were you not interested in that? Never, ever, no, no, no. Okay. I, I don't, I, I don't think I have a great face for TV, and, and <laughs> it wasn't my crowd. <laughs> okay, no, honestly, okay, but you knew you yeah, loved voiceovers. I, I loved using my voice because you know, my life prior to coming to the United States had been in the media. I had been a news anchor, a news reader, and I made radio and, and some television programs as well. And I always noticed when we went to the when to the canteen of a uh, uh, broadcasting company, there were special tables for the television folks and different tables for the radio folks, and they did not mingle. The television folks all seemed to be very self-absorbed and very conscious of their looks, very pretentious as well, and very on guard because they were always recognized in public and people wanted things from them. And that made mm. them not such pleasant people to be with because they were always like, what do you want from me? They only want an autograph or something. They're very, very standoffish and sometimes very conceited too because they were watched by millions of people every night. So they thought, you know what? I must be very special. The radio folks are like the friend, like they're like desperate yes. for a chat, aren't they? Yes, it's just <laughs> unpretentious as heck. Absolutely. They have no ego. And that's what I loved about them. So I very, very young age, I knew that television, all the pretentiousness was not really for me. I love to hang with voice over people and with radio people because they don't get recognized in the streets. And, uh, they don't have this thing of how you know, they have to uphold a certain image or identity. So we can be very down to earth and we can be ourselves. And now I lost my train of thought. I know it had to do with moving on to television and you got your agent, you yes, got into voiceover. Agent. Right. Yes, yes, yes. So, oh yeah. Accents, accents. So I got the advice from the agent that she said, you know, Paul, if you ever want to book in the United States as a voiceover, you got to do an accent reduction training because you don't sound like Americans and most jobs are for people with an American accent. So they wouldn't do that sound... now, would they? That surprises no, me. No, no. This was, this was in 2000. So 21 years ago. Wow. And then I went to someone else who was also an expert in the field. And she said the opposite. Paul never, ever do that because you sound like no one else. You have this strange mishmash of, of, of English of of european that we cannot pinpoint and i by listening to your voice and cannot tell where you're from and that really is an asset we don't have someone like that in our talent pool because you know when you have companies that operate internationally they sometimes don't want someone with an american accent because there's a certain connotation attached to that accent positive but always but often not so positive yeah. same thing often. for a stiff upper lip british <laughs> accent you know yeah yeah they think oh they're you know why are all the villains in movies always british why do they have a british accent you know because they think this is a sort of mad academic professor who talks like this very <laughs> stuff blah 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 blah, blah. You know? so for instance if you're in india and you want to sell products to an indian audience they have uh 
a past of Britain being their colonizer. So in the English accent, British accent, is not so popular. It's better to have a more Americanized accent in India if you want to sell stuff. Whereas saying that I'd was... kill to have a British accent because the psychological yeah. thrillers I want to do usually go to the British girls. Correct. <laughs> yes, they do. <laughs> Yeah. And if you want to sell something in the United States, you want to sound European and more sophisticated, they love British accents. That's yeah. almost what they said when I came to the United States. Oh, I love your British accent. We do. I oh. married my husband because, yeah. well, Scottish. But uh -huh. that was, it was the accent. I told yes. him, you want to divorce me? Dump me in a pub in Glasgow. I'll be married again in 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> You're easy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, I, 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 and that goes back to watching television and watching it subbed instead of dubbed. Right. My love for languages, my love for different accents and, and melody and words and customs, all of these things led up to me eventually becoming a voiceover. And that got its kickstart as me as this young six, seven year old reading to the grown ups in a library and winning a prize. Now, obviously, at that time, I had no idea that. This was a job that I could do professionally. But do you know how wonderful, do you know, it makes you think, because a lot of narrators are also educators or used to be, just think it takes, and I think Scott Brick said this on a call the other day that, you know, a teacher brought him to Broadway, like on a, really encouraged, it takes one person, one time to encourage you, to like light a spark that look at you. And then you in turn have, Lit a thousand spark, lit a thousand sparks. Seriously, mm -hmm. so it's like that one experience right. has touched yes. many people. Yes. So, and if you're listening and watching this right now, I want you to think about that one person that caused that spark, and think about the last time you spoke to that person. Mm. And maybe you've never spoken to the person again, or maybe that person is no longer alive. But I want you in the next couple of days to take some time to reach out to that person, if he or she is still alive, and say what you wanted to say to that person, thank that person. And if that person is no longer alive, you can still do it. Just close your eyes and think about that person, see what you hear, see what you see, hear what you hear, and feel what you feel and express your deep felt gratitude to that person. And if the yeah. person is still alive, do not postpone, do not wait, because life is fickle. You never know what will happen, especially yeah. in this strange time of COVID. And make that call, write that letter, send that note, and don't postpone it. Do it now. Can I ask you, and and stop me if it if it's too much, if you'd rather not, but... I was, I told, I told Paul at the beginning of this call that when people knew that Paul was going to be on, somebody sent me an email saying that they'd followed Paul's blog post because Paul had a, quite a health thing occur when he was in his booth recording one day. And I told Paul, I think when something happens to a narrator in the community, it, it's, we're all knocked down a little bit. And months before that happened to Paul, a narrator had died. And I didn't know them at all. But I remember seeing the posts on social media and they were about my age. And, 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 you, and I was horrified by it because it was like they were doing what I do on a normal day. And, you know, just like that, it was, you know, and you get to, maybe it's my age, you become maudlin, but you get to a certain age and you see that and, you, and it worries you, it scares you and it, and you feel like you've lost someone you know, because we all see each other online. And then Paul posted a blog post. Are you comfortable telling us about that? Because it, I remember after seeing your post, being relieved as if you were a relative. And I think it's part of us being in the online world, but it's partly your voice has supported so many of us for so long. It was like one of us made it through. And it, it touched me deeply. I can't tell you how much that touched me, even though you and I had never had a conversation, but I'd read your book, I'd read your blogs. Um, did it change me, you, that experience? Can you tell oh us a little gosh, bit about yes. it? Oh Are you gosh, comfortable yes. talking about it? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I, I've given this a lot of thought because in the beginning, 
I thought, you know, should I share my health challenges with the world? Because um, my colleagues read it and a lot of my work comes to me through my colleagues. And as soon as they find out that I'm not well anymore or that something terrible happened to me health wise, will they ever reach out to me again and refer work, uh, jobs to me? Can I, I can I interject just one yeah. only because I don't want to, um, a friend of mine was advised by a coach recently not to tell them that she'd had a brain pro injury. She'd gotten yeah. in a bad car accident or something like that. And she turned around and she started a group of fellow narrators, voiceover people that have had things happen or that have disabilities. And so many people have now joined it. The thing is, there is that kind of, but I think, I hope, it's an old-fashioned business mentality, and it's going out the window because all of us are broken. All of us are broken, and it doesn't stop us doing our job. And our broken bits are what make us strong. They're in our voices. Absolutely. So I hope that that concern that you had is going to be non-existent in a few years with people that are brave like my friend speaking yes. up going no i'm going to speak up this doesn't change i'm a good narrator i'm great at what i do this happened to me it isn't me i'm going to shut up now and let you finish your story sorry but i just wanted to interject that i think it's so important because we've seen it in the sports world as well you know with naomi osaka and uh, mm -hmm. Simone Biles, yeah. they all dare to be vulnerable. And that's what the, was the decision that I made too, because what happened to me was I was sitting in this chair that I'm sitting in right now. I was doing my work as a narrator. I was working on a script and all of a sudden I had a blackout. And when I woke up, I was on the floor of my studio and it felt weird. Something I'd never felt in my entire life before. And I tried to get up to get back on my chair and half of my body was paralyzed and had you been feeling sick prior to this or was you were perfectly fine well, just in the i had this was the precursor i had atrial fibrillation an okay. irregular fast heartbeat which was instrumental in what happened to me because you know what happened to me was i had a stroke so i woke up paralyzed and the first thing you want to do is it's an impulse, but you want to shout for help. And I noticed that I, my speech was slurred. A part of my, my face was like drooping and drooling. And I thought, ow, oh, ow. Oh. I talked like a drunken God. pirate at that moment. I was just so weird. Had an intense headache and also felt that I was running out of air because I had no idea for how long I had been on the floor. But imagine this. I was on the floor of my soundproof booth. I have this very heavy, thick double door that was I very mean, And your wife open. was out or something on an errand, wasn't she? She was. I was at home by myself. She was um, at a council meeting. And thank goodness I told her, because my wife was a, a town councillor at, at that time. I said, you know what? I'm going to come to the council meeting. No matter what happens, you can expect me there. And when I didn't show up, my wife has this very intuitive connection with me and I have it with my wife because we've been through so much. She f immediately felt this gut feeling of something is wrong. And the police chief who was there at the council meeting looked at my wife and, and walked up to her and said, is there something I can do for you? Because I see that you're distraught. And she said, you know what? I don't have any evidence of me f of this, but I feel something is wrong with my husband. Could you do a welfare check? Because... I have a feeling something's, something's not right. And that turned out to be the call that saved my life. Because I was there. I was paralyzed. I couldn't open the door. I shouted, but nobody could hear me because it's a soundproof room. And my neighbors, were they couldn't hear me either because it's a soundproof room. And um, I don't know for how long I was on the floor. But um, after a while, I heard voices. And with the last strength that I had in me, I moved literally with my last breath. I knocked on the walls because these guys had no idea where I would be. I knocked on the walls of this studio. The door opened. And I remember that suction sound of his fresh air came in. I could finally breathe again. And the chief of uh, the fire, the fire chief looked at me and said, this guy is having a stroke. We need to get him to the hospital. So they medevac me. Uh, they brought me to a helicopter, never been in a helicopter before. They took me on a helicopter ride to a stroke center nearby. 
And uh, on the way to the stroke center, my wife got a call from the specialist who was going to operate on me. And he said, I'm going to be too busy with your husband, so I want to talk to you about it right mm -hmm. now. There's two options. One, he's probably not going to make it because we have no idea for how long he has been there on the floor. And with strokes, the earlier you intervene, the greater your chance of survival. So either he's not going to make it or another scenario is that he will wake up and he's going to be severely handicapped because every second that's taking away oxygen is to the killing brain. his brain cells. And brain cells never grow back. Fingernails grow back, hair grows back, but brain cells never grow back. So those are the two scenarios you have to prepare yourself for. Either your husband is dead or he'll be a plant for the rest of his life. And obviously neither of the scenarios happened because I had a brilliant surgeon and in the middle of the procedure where they, they put a tube up your groin area and they send the camera up there and a little grabbing thing here that goes up to your brain. And what happened was that my, 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 my heart sent a blood clot to my brain, which caused a stroke. And I have to grab the blood clot from inside into it. And I woke up when they did that. I felt that grabber inside of my head. They took it out. And I felt an instant relief. And all I can remember is the smile on the face of the surgeon who operated on me. And he did this, Paul, you're going to be okay. You're going to be okay. And, and like uh, 12 hours later, I woke up in the hospital bed and had no idea who I was, where I was. I could not access my emotions, which was so weird. And I couldn't speak. I could mumble, but I could not speak. And then they told me what had been going on. And they said, you know, well, take your time. It's going to be a while. And uh, you've got a long road ahead of you, which was indeed the case. It took me about a year of speech therapy to get back to me being able to read a little bit. You start with words, words become sentences, sentences become paragraphs, paragraphs become chapters. So they finally could, could talk a little bit. But I could not infuse my words with emotion. That was the weird thing. I always describe it like I could see where my emotion, emotions were. They were like hidden behind a wall, but I could not open that wall, couldn't open the door. That's so our talk, biggest like, tool. That's what we all, that's yeah. our bread and butter. That would, I can't even imagine. Yeah. I wonder what caused yeah. that. I wonder what. Well, it was the part of my brain that was affected. That was the connection to my emotions. And you couldn't even uh, be scared because you had no emotions. <laughs> that, that was pretty handy, but it was, I didn't <laughs> know what to feel. No, that's right. That's right. And till this day, I'm not scared because you know what? The worst thing that could ever happen to me has already happened and yeah. I survived. So I'll never be scared again, which is kind of uh, dangerous in and of itself, too, because it's a good thing to be scared of things because... I act very impulsively. I lost my impulse control after my stroke. I became a very different person. I became very impulsive. And I used to cross the road without looking left and right. So there's a couple of times that my wife really had to drag me back and say, Paul, what are you doing? Because I was just impulsively crossing the road because I wasn't scared of anything. And uh, so I had to relearn how to speak and le relearn how to infuse my words with emotions with the help of a speech therapist. And uh, ultimately, as you can tell, I have no problems emoting. It yeah. came back. It came back. <laughs> There's no, no thing that, that, that did it to me, but love, I think, and human connection. And it started when I was in the hospital already, peeling away the, the layers that needed to be peeled away so I could access my emotions again, because I really felt the love and the connection with the people that were not there, but were with me through social media and with all that's been said about the downside of social media and there are many downsides the connection that we have through facebook and instagram and all the other media has been invaluable to me especially in my times of need because i still remember those lonely nights in the hospital where i was wondering will i ever make it would i ever survive and i had shared what had happened to me and that it was really and limbo land in limbo land in terms of what my future would be and then the messages started coming in from people from all over the world who had been following my blog yeah. following my instagram account and 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 my tweets and had been listening to my my audiobooks 
And I was said, one of oh, them. I've never reached out to a stranger like that in my life. But, right. but you, somebody yeah. said, I've got a question about that, about I wonder if, because the nature of what you do as an artist, using your voice and connecting your emotions to it, and they say that the way you use your brain, you're building strength in whatever way you re- use it repeatedly. So those pathways must have been incredibly strong. So when they're thinking that you're going to like just ha- maybe not get completely, you know, back. Whereas I wonder if the nature of who you were and what you did for a living placed you well to regain that and Leslie said your brain created new pathways it's remarkable how we heal and I bet your brain because of who you are and what you do found its way back absolutely absolutely it's making new neural networks new pathways because brain cells once you lose them they're never coming back you can't go to the supermarket and say can I get a, a jar of brain cells please yeah, but then they are coming back. But so if it's a you new rewire. pathway, it's just using different cells. Is that what's happening? Yes, exactly. You rewire okay. your brain. And that's, I have to, um, to thank my, my, my academical background as well, because not only um, we talked about my background in radio in the Netherlands, that I was a news anchor and everything like that. But after that, I had a career in, in coaching and counseling, because I studied a thing called NLP, Neuro Linguistic oh. Psychology, which is all yeah. about positive mindset. And so it, it's it's kind of the power of, of I call it the power of make believe, because you can make yourself believe anything. We do it every single day. We create self fulfilling prophecies. It's how you look at life about what's possible and what's not possible that allows you to do what you do and take the chances that you take in life. And if you think, Mm. well, you know, everything's going downhill from here, (laughs) that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Mm. Whereas you, when you tell yourself, no, it can only get better from here and I can do everything and I want to do everything in my power to get back to the person I was. No, a different person, maybe even a better person. You can make that happen too, with the right help and the right inspiration. So I think mindset is really definitely a very important element in my recovery. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love it because I was listening to somebody, um, a psychologist talking about epigenetics and talking about how a lot of people grow up with families with different health issues. And you assume that you inherit those, that their fate is going to become your fate. But when you, at some point, if you realize that that's a learned assumption and that you've got way more power than you think you do. And that you, yes, your past was your past, but right now we're in charge of the language we use. And the worst, there's a really important question that's come up and I don't want it to fall down back on the list. So I think it's really fascinating. And I also think it could be valuable for us to talk about on here. Um, Grace asked, what do you recommend for an emergency alert system for when you need help or when your wife needs your help? because we're all in booths. Do you now have something to protect yourself in case it ever happens again or? No, no. well, for me, it was my door because one of the things that led to it was that I don't have any ventilation in my booth. When I close my door, that's it. When I need ventilation, I open my door. So part of that I lost uh, my oxygen was because it's, it's, it's a closed off space. And I, I, I am a person who lives in the moment when I, when I'm working on a script, when I'm recording, I forget every sense of time. So I had already been recording, been using up lots of my oxygen in the booth, which made it harder for my heart to work, which ultimately caused a stroke. So now my alert system is to make sure that I open the studio door. But I can imagine that people would use uh, like this, what, I don't know what you call them, but they're these um, little bra- uh, bracelets with uh, a button that you can push. Don't yeah, I mean, we should that? maybe consider that. I mean, I've never yeah. even thought about it. We're locked in. And like, yeah. whereas if I go by myself, like to a walk in the woods, which like I don't because I'm a city girl. But if I were going to do it, I would make sure someone knew where I was going to be. And so I was safe. But we go in that booth and never even think about like making right. sure someone knows where you are. But the thing is, once you pass out, there's nothing you can do. You can't press a button and you're passed out. So, yeah, um, yeah for me, I, I used to be 
even more sedentary than I am right now because I'd love to, I love my work so much. I stay in front of this microphone for hours yeah. on end. I forget time, but now I made a, a promise to myself that I will get up no matter how much I love it. I get up every half an hour and then walk around and change position and then come back again so that I never run into that thing where I'm in it for hours and forget time. And I've got to start doing that. Time. I've yeah. got to start doing that. I'm paying for my bad lifestyle choices. Turns out yeah. you can't just narrate every single day for two years and not leave the flat and get away with it. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> yeah. Because it impacts your work. The thing is, you could do it thinking, oh, I'll be the best narrator on earth. I'm working every day. But you're not because you become horrible at your job because mm -hmm. you're wheezing and worried. And Okay. Yeah. Scott Brick keeps a glass breaker in his studio bricks booth. That's a good uh -huh. idea. That's a really good idea. If you yeah, have a glass it, in your booth. <laughs> a, a, a lot of people, a lot of people are on here. It's you never even consider it. It blew my mind when I heard that. And, and yeah. before we go any further, I just want to say, I'm so glad you made it. <laughs> Me <laughs> because too. your blog posts and your wisdom. And so let's get to your, your blog posts because Paul, the thing I like about Paul, a lot of people reacted, a lot of people actually sent me messages. A lot of people were like, well, I disagree with a lot of what he says, but I love his blog posts. And the thing is, is you, you have quite a big audience. You're very, very candid. But what I like the most about what you say about mindset and everything is the, it's not fair. Get on with it. And I'm big on motive and I'm obsessed with developing a practice and keeping yourself in it and like making your mind strong so that working is the important thing not the waiting for the external even reviews I think a good review is just as bad for you as a bad review because you're reinforcing you're like the map what is it Pavlov's dog you're reinforcing that like you know, oh, give me another sweet. Give me another sweet. You know what I mean? It's yeah. So, yeah. tell me what you wish your students would understand and figure out that sometimes you have a hard time getting them to know, to understand. Some people think that I blog because I want to convince them of my opinion, and they think that I'm self-righteous. That I always think I'm right, and that I want to lecture people or preach to people because I know it all. I've seen it all, I've done it all, so this know-it-all from Europe is going to tell the mostly American audience what to do and how to do it. Your opinion is your opinion, though. Why would you write a blog right. if it wasn't your opinion? Well, I'm very opinionated, and people think that opinionated people want to convince the rest of the world that they're right. And I don't, because I don't think that I'm right. It's You're right. It's just a, an opinion of a guy who has a big mouth with a big platform. It's just me. <laughs> You know, who am I really? <laughs> I want to be an instigator. I want to be a motivator, an inspirator, and an encourager. But I don't want people to start thinking what I'm thinking. That would be scary and would be redundant. Mm -hmm. I want to be that little spark that lights a fire under people's toches and have them think for themselves. They don't need to agree with me at all. That would be so boring and if everybody would agree with me i really like it that people disagree with me because then we can have a dialogue yeah and so i i even though i'm the son of a minister and people feel sometimes that i preach i i just want to have a conversation about it and say you know this is how i think about it based on this this and this and that and they can refute me they can dispute it but we can have a conversation about it a conversation that's a little bit longer than a Facebook thread where you can have three sentences, then someone else chimes in and three sentences. You know, I want to present my case to the world of voiceovers. And then they can say, well, this guy from Europe is crazy. Or they say, well, there's something to it. Let's think about that. That's all I really want. I want to move minds if I can, but they don't have to agree with me at all. The less they agree with me, the more confrontational they probably think I am. And the better it is for my blog because people love a good yeah. fight i never i never ever i don't i can't think of anything that sounded confrontational i do remember the pay to play blog but that didn't yeah. even but but i can't imagine anyone not agreeing with that one 
but I mean, I know that yeah. like I tend to every once in a while, if I have an epiphany, I'll like write a long, I think very wise post about how I've just figured out the world, but then I forget to interact when people respond yeah. because like, i just like want to put it out there. I'm not thinking about like, I just think you share your thoughts at the moment, which lets mm-hmm. us join you on the journey as you're growing and learning and changing, which is why I like these calls because we're joining each other. We're all on the same journey in different places. And every once in a while we can hitch a ride with someone else and look at it from their point of view. So absolutely, absolutely. And um, my main device is really storytelling. And I think I've learned that even more after my stroke, I've become less radical, less confrontational, a little bit more milder, I think, because, you know, I don't want to convince people by saying, well, this is my opinion, take it or leave it. I take them on that journey. I tell a story about what it's like. For instance, we were talking about how our beliefs could change our actions and our actions change our results, right? And that our mindset determines the outcomes that we get and that a Mm. negative mindset will lead to more negative outcomes and vice versa. So I could tell that to you, but I could also tell you a story about my dad. My dad was a minister and he worked for most of his life in a hospital as a pastor. And he said, Paul, when I walk into a hospital room and there's a patient who isn't doing well, I can pretty much predict how he will end, whether he will survive or die. I said, how is that, Dad? Well, he said, it depends on their faith. I said, tell me about that. Well, he says, sometimes I have patients that feel that the cancer that they have that is killing them is a punishment from God, that they have to undergo it. They can't rebel against God because God in his or her or it eternal wisdom has determined that they deserve to be punished for all the bad things they've done in their lives, so they must die. Cancer is a punishment from God. And if you internalize that, if you believe that you have to listen to God, then they won't do anything to fight that disease. So these people are more likely to die. Whereas when I go into a different room with another religious person, he says, you know what? My great example is Jesus. What did Jesus do? He healed the sick and he helped people rise from the dead. I don't believe God is this big punisher, big sadist who wants people to suffer and die. No, I believe God is love. God is life. God wants me to do everything I can to fight this disease. And that's what I will do. And these people same belief, same religion, different mindset, different interpretation, have a different chance of survival. So that's a story. And that's illustrating the power of belief. And I think that a blog is an ultimate tool to tell these stories, not to say, you know, this is what I feel, but to write stories about myself, about other people, about my students, and give that to people as a mirror, as an example. And hopefully that will do something to them that will change them inside and make them a better person, a different person, and encourage them to take action. And look at the stories they tell themselves, because I know Mm -hmm. that the stories we tell are, the stories I've lately realized that the stories I tell myself are like my biggest blocks. Like, and no, none of it's true. It's just Mm -hmm. the way you're looking at it right this minute. Right. As they say, whether you're right or wrong, it doesn't matter. You're always right. Yeah. And so what I do is that a lot of my blogs are really stories to sell as well. And whenever you read something about an issue that resonates with you, you can bet that it's resonated with me and I'm struggling to find answers. And I want to take people on that journey without making it too much about me because, you know, I hate those blogs. It's always about me, me, me. Look at me, how great I am and what I did. No, I often tell it about other people and circumstances that are inspiring, but I use metaphors. And in a way, writing about voiceovers is a metaphor about life because we're all voiceovers, but not only that, we're freelancers, we're self-employed, independent contractors. And as these people, as freelancers, we all struggle with the same thing. Yeah. And the great thing that made my blog very well read is that maybe 20% of the people that read my blog are in voiceovers, but the rest is also creative freelancers, 
mm-hmm. that are all self-employed and and, and independent contractors because they recognize our struggles. They're dealing with finding work, keeping work, return business, how to promote themselves using social media, how to present them well in public, how to deal with rejection, how to deal with finances. What do you do with the finance clients? was scary. When I got your book, I was struggling. It took me two years of like serious dark nights of the soul. Because yeah. did you say you started off freelance most I've of your life? Been a freelancer. All of my life. I've always been self employed. Yes. It's a shock when you haven't yeah. been. <laughs> and I didn't realize because I kept thinking, what do I do? And I was looking for it in your book. I was like, what do I do to like get my security, my guaranteed income? I kept waiting for that. What do I do to be good enough to have guaranteed income past the next three, four months? And I didn't get, you don't, it's not what you do to get the money. It's what you do to change yourself. So you become a person that doesn't need the security. Mm -hmm. That's right. And one of the, 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 the threads that is woven throughout my blog is that you are your own security. Yeah. It's down to you. The buck stops at you, which is scary, but you are your greatest asset, which is really comforting as well. Because everything that you invest in yourself, you invest in your career, which will ensure your success and which will make it easier for you to attract the work that you love and make the money that you need to make in order to thrive. But you you know that you were saying it in your book and I wasn't, I had to be ready. It's one of those, I had to, um, Deborah, you do need to read Paul's book and his blog. She says she's sitting here doing her accounts while listening. So yes, it's, it's like, you know, that book you read and everyone else loves it and says it's life changing. And you're just like, meh. And then like four years later, you read it again and all of a sudden it's the best book you've ever seen in your life. But like, I think, and I said that about your blog in the beginning, in the beginning, it kind of scared me. I think that's why now I'm a different person. I see just wisdom. I was looking for a post that would be um, confrontational. I was looking for a blog post that I didn't agree with because I remember there were a lot of Paul's blog posts that triggered me. I couldn't find one before, before this call. Because I'm ready, I think, to listen to the stories you're telling. That's wonderful to hear. Absolutely wonderful. And, you know, when people are triggered, it is always easy to to blame the person that they say is pushing their button. (laughs) And it's so easy to blame people for your lack of success. And that's an easy way out. Because... You don't have to take responsibility. It's always the other person's fault. Oh, Paul made me feel this way because what he wrote in his blog was so mean and nasty. And then you've got no control because it's the control you've given it to someone else, haven't you? Paul's in charge of your life now. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. please no. I don't want that responsibility. No, 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 no. You are responsible for your own deeds, your own actions, your own thought. And if you want to be inspired by my blog, great. If you want to use my blog as a, a, a bouncing board, you know, sometimes you need resistance in life to make you stronger. If I can be that resistance, well, by all means, blame it on me. Paul said this nasty thing and really <laughs> made me kick into gear. And now I know what I'm finally doing. Sometimes people need a firm kick in the pants, especially newcomers who think that what we do is so easy and it just will come to you. And that's... Most of the not so positive responses are from people who really don't know much about the business and think that I'm going to be the rain on their parade and they call me the Debbie Downer voiceovers because I'm telling them it's not that fun in the beginning. It's not instant success. I remember my first wife was an air hostess and she wanted to be a stewardess because of the travel. She thought, you know what, I can be on KLM Airlines and see the world. And then she got this training and six weeks later after her training, she discovered that she was just a waitress in the air with nasty people <laughs> and who didn't like the food and thought the seats were too cramped. And <laughs> they, they, they patted on the behind and it was, they were rude and obnoxious and drunk and all that stuff. She said, well, it's not what I 
thought it was cooked up to be. It's I like wanted to. Dinner. I wanted to be a flight because we used to go to Italy every summer. My father's from Italy, and they'd be walking through the airport behind the pilot and the gorgeous out. I'm really old, so they were still classy and gorgeous, you know, with those outfits, smoking their yeah. cigarettes. I either wanted to be an air hostess or a Bond girl. Oh, I didn't man. get to be either, but. <laughs> At the time, it was, I don't blame your ex-wife. It looks really fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, you know, in, in the same way, a voiceover career can look very glamorous and it can also mm -hmm. seem very easy. And if I rain on those people's parades, well, so be it. Someone's going to say it because you're not going to hear it for the people who want your money, you know? And the, and, and because I, I, I tell things the way I see them, I don't always make friends in the voiceover establishment. There's lots of CEOs of pay to plays that, that can drink my blood because I said, Paul, you are dis destroying the image that we try to create, that you can hand over $499 a year and will send all the jobs you can want to audition for to your email box and you start making money right off the bat. And I tell people, it doesn't work that way. It's not that easy. It's a professional thing. Just like, do you think that, you know, think of a musician that you admire. You know, do you think that person got to where he or she is just by sending 500 bucks to a company every year and getting all the gigs that she wants to do? Absolutely not. It's not, I don't know why people don't get that. <laughs> and so yeah. that, that, uh, but those are some of the responses that are less than positive, but I have been so overwhelmed by the most positive and wonderful and warm responses. Like what you're saying as well, that of the people that said, Paul, your, your writing this week touched me on a deeper level yeah. because you were thinking about something that I was dealing with at that moment. Yeah, I was and, annoyed at the award thing. Sometimes <laughs> I get the award. Sometimes it's great. Yeah. But it's always like when I'm having a rotten day anyway. And because yeah. there's no other reason I'm going to be on like social media in the middle of the day when I should be working. I've had a rotten day. I log on and all of a sudden I'm confronted with 40 posts from friends saying, oh my God, out of the clear blue sky, all the publishers and everyone loves me so much. Thank you. And then I read Paul's post about awards and it made me instantly happy. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes hearing an irreverent take on things is just what you need. <laughs> well, if you can on one day, make one person happy for one moment. I think that's a good day, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So I, even though I'm very proud of the number of subscribers, there are like 40,000 people subscribing to my blog. And that's on top of all the people that read it every week. And I have about 4,000 people who read my stuff on, on Instagram because I have a weekly blog on my website, nethervoice.com. Nether is a Netherlands voice and voice, make it one word, nethervoice.com. A weekly blog, but I blog every day on Instagram. And I'm very proud of that. But ultimately, it's about that one person that writes to me like the things that you say. You've touched me. You've made me look at things in a different way. And what is better than that? What is more encouraging and more beautiful than that? That you can help somebody get a different perspective. Yeah, Whether shake like us out of our own stories. Because yes, when you're exactly. when you're new, your stories are rubbish because they're stupid. <laughs> because you don't well, you don't know any better because you've not been there. Yeah. Right. So most people don't know what they don't know. Yeah. And they don't want to admit it. You know. Yeah. And they act as if they do. You know. It's that Dunning Kruger effect. And that is kind of annoying. But the thing is, then I'm of two minds because then there are all these posts going around and I get the point of it. There a lot of times you, you hear the professionals, the people that have been doing in every industry, photography, narration, voiceover, the oldies telling the newies, don't be so rude. Don't ask for our help and advice. If you haven't slogged through the muck for five years, I don't want to hear about it. And, you know, I'm very, very welcoming, but you have to do your research and you have to approach me this way and you have to. The thing is, the new people that are just idiots are going to drop off naturally. And the ones that aren't, that do want to hold on, maybe they don't know how to approach someone. And like telling them off isn't maybe they're going to learn or they're not going to make it. They're going to learn it. They're not going to make it. Don't make it a personal quest. To, it's like you getting that thing when you were like six years old. Maybe mm -hmm. 
one positive experience and just ignore all the, I know it gets annoying when you've worked really, really hard and all of a sudden people are like, I think I'm just going to do what you do. <laughs> I've got my phone. Yeah. I'll, I'll read know. a book into my phone on the, or walking around the park. <laughs> yes. yes, yes. <laughs> well, I'm very ambivalent about those requests because I want people to do their homework before they approach me because my time is valuable. And in the beginning, I was so open and I spent so much time helping people. And it's a thankless task because they spend an hour with you and there's no thank you ever. They just expect you to that you can pick your that they can pick your brain instead of them doing their homework. And mm -hmm. I think back to the time that I got my start in radio. I didn't know anything. There wasn't an internet, but I did my research. I interviewed people who were doing what I wanted to do, and I read books. I was came very well prepared before I really had my start. So people knew that and they respected that. And nowadays the people that approach me just they don't know very much. They have this dream and they can dream all they want, but they don't prepare themselves. They don't show to me that they're committed. They think yeah. it's interesting. They think they're interested, but they're not committed. And I have to, I, I, my time is too valuable to spend that with people. But you can just prepare. refer them to your blog. I mean, That's I refer them thing. if they're a narrator, I send them to Karen Commons roadmap, narrator's yeah. roadmap. If they're a voiceover, I send them to your blog, tell yeah. them to buy your book. Hire Sean Pratt as a coach if you're voiceover. You know what I mean? It's send them. Some, there's so many resources to send them to. And then just go on your way. We don't have to. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's Exactly. Yes, yes, yes. And that's a great thing about having a blog because I have about, I think, 570 blog posts on there. And that those are like five to ten minute reads each. So I take a deep dive in whatever it is that I'm exploring so I can refer people to that, which is very, very handy. And I could also have you know, read my book. And sometimes when I really feel that somebody's trying on, on social media and they're not getting a response or very nasty responses, I'll approach them directly, send them a direct message and give them a link to my book so they can get a free PDF copy of that book. And um, so I, I don't want to just blow them off and say, you're obviously a newbie and you didn't ask the right questions. You didn't earn your money yet. Yeah, I so think that's what I we have to be time? careful of. That's yeah. the thing. I yeah. get the sentiment behind it. And there are a lot of resources. And I need to, you know, what you said, I need to be better with boundaries because, yeah. because I've not quite got that bit down. But there's so many resources now. But I always think underneath it all, remember like six-year-old Paul being given a chance to win just underneath it all I don't want to be the person that I don't want to be the person that gives that if somebody had a precarious chance somebody told me once you're not an if you were ever going to be an actress you'd be an actress so the fact that you aren't means that you weren't meant to be or it means that I'm not one yet, <laughs> you know what I mean? But I listened to them. But, yeah. and I, I hate people that say, um, oh, well, if they're easily discouraged, they don't have a thick enough skin, they don't belong in the business. But I didn't have a thick skin when I was young. And a lot of actors I know don't have thick skins, but you finally get fed up enough, you get a thick skin. Now my thin skin's like rawhide leather. Yeah. <laughs> well, I you know. I always tell people I don't mind ignorance, but I don't like willful ignorance. And yeah. With so much information floating around in cyberspace. It's very hard to be willfully ignorant. You have to be really good at not, not doing your homework. Yeah. Don't so take advantage. I'm very encouraging to people who want to, to, who show to me that they've done their homework. And then I'll be very generous with my time. I'll be happy to coach them, and I, I offer them reduced rates if they can't if they can't uh, if they can't afford it. And whenever they coach with me, I tell them, "You are now connected for life." You mean you paid for your five sessions or ten sessions or for however long? This means that you can always call on me without having to pay for it. But also generosity, Paul. The content in your blog. People, I'm so, I'm going to say this. I'm not. I, I am the queen of hyperbole. You guys know me, but I'm saying this hand on heart. The content in Paul's blog is worth 
and more valuable than six coaches full time all together. If you look at that blog and don't walk away with like strong mindset training, success, freelance work, then you just you're not you're missing something really obvious. You give everything away in that blog. So like you give a lot away in that blog. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Why shouldn't I? I mean, there's no reason if you have information that could help people become successful and change their lives. It, I think it's almost sinful to keep it to yourself. I mean, hey, what I do is I don't have a program and I coach people where I take them through this same person, to this, the, take a different person through the same program step by step by step. So I know that I cater to people's needs. And so I, I can give away what I want to give away. And I mean, that's the beauty of life. If you have information, share it. Otherwise, yeah. what good does it do? You know, it's, it's yeah. no use information that you don't share. And the value I, in coaching is the relationship with a coach. Yes, so you can't get that. Yes. That's the one thing you can't get from the blog. Exactly. That people have a one-on-one -on -one connection. And yeah. one of the things that don't, they don't like is about me when I coach is I tell them you have to sign up for five sessions. We're going to do five sessions. I don't want to be on trial as a coach. Oh, let's try him for half an hour. Let's see what he can do in 45 minutes and transform my business completely from the ground up. <laughs> see if he can fix my lousy career in a half hour. <laughs> yes, that's what they want. And I, I don't want to. Those are ridiculous I'll take the call and I'll listen to it over and over again. And I'll be a success. Yeah. <laughs> yes. No, it doesn't worry me. So, you know, I can do five sessions and I can work with you, but don't yeah. expect within one session that your life is going to change. You get all the clients and the success that you ever want and deserve. No, we can't do that. So I manage people's expectations mm. and I'm, I'm, I'm so flattered by what you said about my blog, but this reminds me of one of the reasons why I am married to a wife because she's the one who makes sure that I stay down to earth. <laughs> and I already have a pretty voluminous head and I get a bigger head as at least listen to all these people saying nice things about me. But when I go up and she says, Paul, what was it like? Well, I said, you know, she said so many nice things, Danielle. I really think that, um, that can be very proud of what it did. Oh, come on. She says, now go do the dishes, you know, <laughs> but the thing, the thing, really the, the thing is you, you, I mean, I've had people in the beginning get a little bit put off because I'll do the promo bit videos and I'll be saying what I think is terrific about them. And then there's like I, one girl I had to like literally argue with. She's like, I was calling her the queen of Rome or the princess of romance or something. She said, I'm not a princess. Okay. The queen of romance. I'm not a queen. I'm not like, don't just, just, can you, somebody that can give you romance advice. I'm not going to call you somebody. It's like the language that I use is genuine and it's nothing that other people don't think either but we have a hard time seeing ourselves and I think that I've stopped I used to try to tone it down but I'm embracing the American in me it's why shouldn't I say out loud on these calls what I love the most about people and I think that we don't we're in our booths all day so the opportunity to be told just how much we're appreciated. And that's all it is, is you are so appreciated. This, I wouldn't have reached out to you as like a total stranger if you hadn't touched my life. So you can tell your wife, we think <laughs> you're very appreciated and thank you for keeping him down to earth. <laughs> <laughs> I got to play this interview to her. <laughs> you um, know, yes. This I have to ask a I... question. Sorry, I'm yes, going to interrupt please. you, but I don't want to lose yeah. this question. Mm -hmm. um, very important, quirky question. Where are the clog slippers? I don't understand oh that gosh. question. <laughs> that's, that's a great question because some people might know me from wearing clog slippers. This happened when I first went to voiceover Atlanta. And I had forgotten at what time we were all supposed to come together. So I was getting in my room and I have these slippers that are shaped like yellow Dutch clogs, but they've got memory foam in them and they don't, not are made of wood, but they're very fluffy. They're very comfortable. <laughs> they're fluffy. <laughs> and I, I took them with me just because I want to be comfortable in my hotel room. And um, I, was, I was just relaxing a little bit in my hotel room and looked at my watch and said, oh my goodness, I got to go down for the social meet and greet. So I, I left my room and I saw people walk down, look at my feet. 
I said, what's going on? Do my feet smell or something? No, the, <laughs> the, 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 I forgot to, to put my shoes on. I'd left my clogs. And everybody, everybody said, wow, those are great clogs. You must be Paul from the Netherlands. And I decided to keep them on. And throughout that first uh, Voice of Atlanta, that's that's what people remember me by. It's the guy with the clogs, and it's an instant connection. It's a good branding exercise. Yeah, and yes, it's the best twenty five bucks I've ever spent on marketing. You know, I'm branding. Yeah. Good so question, Leslie. I, I usually have them <laughs> behind me, but I got to tell you, I am on the move because I live in Pennsylvania now, and in a couple of weeks we're going to move to Vermont. I'm going to go to the middle of nowhere, five minutes away from the Canadian border in the town of Newport, where we have found our dream home. It's oh, so wow. quiet. That's our little cabin in the woods. I know you spoke with some uh, one of my colleagues who lives in a co uh, cabin in the woods, and that's going to be my existence too. So we have spent literally the last couple of months packing our life in boxes and putting it in storage so we could sell our house. And our realtor is right up there with my wife now, who's who's putting her name on the, the, the sales papers. So it's all going to happen. So all the shelves behind me, they're completely empty. I just that, left uh, that the Dutch VO like sign there. And that's that. And, and nothing is in here. They, you, my clogs used to be there. <laughs> you, should, you should listen to an old book. You might have already heard it years ago. Bill Bryson. I might be wrong, but I think he moved to Vermont. And it was like okay. an expat's take on moving. It's really old, so it'll right. be dated. But I think yeah. it was Vermont. It was like an expat's take on You know, I'm old and dated to too, so I don't mind that. Yeah, it might be a totally different place in America, though. I might have that wrong. So, Paul, I don't want to forget the most important part. As we wrap up these calls, um, I never got to do this in school, and Sean Pratt gave us this idea. So. What I like to do is in school, sometimes they have people put things in it like a steel box, a time lock box, and then they bury it under the ground. And then in like 10 years or so, the reunion, they'll pull up the box and they'll look at what's in it. So for the people on YouTube, that are gonna be watching this video in like 60, 80 years. What would you like to leave them with? What final words of wisdom, funny joke, what would you like to be remembered by them by for the people on YouTube in 60 years? Well, I want to reinforce something that I think already mentioned that to you, you think you're normal. You think you're ordinary. You don't think you're special because you are just you and that's who you are. And that's what I tell my students too, who say, you know what, it's so hard to break into the business of voiceovers because there are so many different voices, so many people who want to pursue this. What do I have to bring to the game? Why would clients want me? Why would people listen to me even, you know? On one hand, they have this desire to become a voiceover. On the other hand, they don't know how to make their mark and create their niche. But, you know, I say to other people, your normal is special. So value yourself for the normal things, for what you bring to the business that nobody else has. Because there's nobody like you with your life experiences, with your history, the good things and the bad things. I mean, the stroke that happened to me, that is a source of inspiration. The worst thing that could happen to me is a source of inspiration. So we've all had moments in our life when... The light went out when we went dark and the moments that we want to forget but those are certain things that you have to tap into as well that make you who you are now and when you look back at these moments you say you know what i survived it i'm a different person i have more i have more stories to tell i've become wiser i've led the richer life i i have become stronger because of all the bad things that happened i've become stronger because of all the good things that happened all these things that determine our mental makeup no matter what you do in life, everything starts between the ears. Even you and I started between somebody's ears, we, believe it or not. That's how we started. That's how creation starts. And what you do with what happens between your ears is up to you. The way, the way you talk to yourself, the way you sing to yourself, the way you say things to yourself, your tone of voice, the words that you choose, the words that you choose to others, the thoughts that you think, those are yours. And because they're yours, 
you can change what you don't like. Certain people feel stuck in the past, feel stuck in patterns that they feel they cannot break through, or feel like a, a victim of what has happened or what people have told them. No, my stroke has taught me that you can reprogram and rewire your brain to really become the person that you are, even a better person. Because when I look back at the Paul, who is all confrontational and sometimes very much self-involved and self-absorbed, that person is no longer there. I think that I've become humbler and more emotional as well. I, I feel that I get more moved by what people say, what people do. When I listen to music, it touches me more. When I watch a show that moves my heartstrings, I really feel it. I, I tear up more easily. That's I think Scott Briggs that... said that about cancer. Uh -huh. yeah. He said, I'm going to yeah. grab every Christmas I can. Yes, it's exactly. too important. Yes, I, I won't be that person who says, well, the stroke is the best thing that ever happened to me, because maybe it is, but that when it happened to me, it was certainly not the best thing. It was yeah. a terrifying thing that happened to me, too. Yeah. I don't want to romanticize it. Like, I have people say, well, my breast cancer was really the best thing that ever happened to me. I think what you do with it, you know, you... One of the reasons I keep on writing, keep on talking, doing interviews like this is it helps me to find meaning in the meaningless because the cancer happened to people, the terrible other things and afflictions that happen to people are, are happening for no reason, not a reason that I can think of that would justify it, would make it right. You know, mm -hmm. why do good people suffer? Why is the suffering? Why do children die at a young age? Why do people kill people on the road when they're drunk and driving while they shouldn't be driving. Why do good things happen to bad people? There is no answer to that question. But we get to the choose story. the story we tell ourselves about it. And as your father yes. said, that story determines what happens. So we're choosing exactly. the ending. So you've got to find meaning in the meaningless. You've got to make sense of the senseless and something that's unreasonable. You've got to struggle with and reason with it. Yeah. And so when, whenever you feel like you're down in the dumps, don't know where to go, and you're waiting for that next audition to come in, that is an opportunity to do some soul searching and connect to that part in you that answers the big question, why? Who am I? Why am I here? Why am I doing what I do? Why am I the person that I'm now right now? Why can't I bring about change and what needs to happen? And what makes it worthwhile what I'm doing right now? And if you can connect to those reasons why you're doing it, then you can find an answer and the what will come. But connect to that self, part of yourself that to you is normal, but to other people is really special. That is your gift to the world. And that's the thing with gifts. You cannot not share it. You have an obligation to share it, a moral obligation to share yourself with the world and make the world better. You made me realize something. I've spent the last week with big emotions and hating them because I hate emotions. They really piss me off unless I'm in the booth and I can use them. But you made me, now flashing back to what you've said, you lost yours and had to fight to get them back. So maybe I shouldn't bitch so much about having emotions. Maybe I should be a little bit grateful. <laughs> just even though they're not maybe the ones I want to have, at least I have emotions. They're signals. They want to tell yeah. you something and it's up to you what you want to do with it. Because if you suppress it, it will only get strong and it will have to come out. And usually it doesn't come out in a good way. Like with anger, you know, if you have to suppress anger, the more you suppress it, the bigger the explosion at the end. So I, I've decided, you know, I'm just going to let it go. I used to be this he man that said, you know, big guys don't cry. Now you should see me watch a, a reality show on TV where, where nice things happen to good people. Like, you know, when people who are totally deserving are being pampered and get their lives, the dream of their life made into a reality. I just have to, my eyes balls start leaking and I have to, I start crying and I, I use my, my Kleenex to, to respond to that. And 
I realized it's okay for big guys to cry. And because yeah. I do that, other people said, you know, if you can cry, I can certainly cry too. And I can be in touch with my emotions. And my stroke has brought me more in touch with my emotions than I ever was before. And that has helped me not only emotionally, but also professionally. That, cause because that's our tool, isn't it? That's a yes. craft. And also yeah. there's a thing called TMS, whereas the other thing, the people that are very, very good at controlling their emotions, um, it's tension, muscular, something. But you can end up with chronic pain, illness. Your body will hold on to those emotions. So if you if you choose to like just not do it, your body's going to like take over. Yes, uh, there's this theory that uh, the language we use is very descriptive. So when you say something is a pain in the neck, it's not figuratively. People really feel a pain in the neck or somebody yeah. is a pain in the butt. You can really feel that in your behind too, you know. And um, so, yes, I think that people reveal how they look at life and how, how they look at themselves through the language that they use. And I always listen very carefully, whether they talk positively about themselves or negatively about themselves, whether they're very self-deprecating or congratulatory. And you can be the best narrator in the world, but if you don't believe you are, if you don't have yeah. the... Then and when you're can... in the booth, you have to be, you have to have that in the booth yes. because people yes. aren't listening to your words. They're listening to what's behind. Exactly. It's all transfer of energy and emotions. Yeah. That's what we do. We transfer energy and emotions in some way, miraculous way, it's picked up on the other side and yeah. can transform people because we have an obligation. Because what we do is there's no other job that I can think of where we get so close into people's face. You know, a lot of people listen to audiobooks these days. And what did they do? Listen to, the to their headphones, usually um, with noise reduction as well. So we get into people's ears, into their minds. There's no profession where you can be as close to a person as the narration yeah. profession that we The have. magic of words. We're transferring yes. energy. It's actually magic. It is. I mean, now it I'm is. getting a little bit. Woo -woo, it is magical. But... It is. We're we transferring strength to people yes. and weakness yes. and emotions. We're sharing emotions to people and a lot of people don't have, they're not in a place where they can. And we're, our job is to be so strong that yes. we can be in a receptor, take them in, send them back out of the emotions mm -hmm. and in control yes. of who we are. We are really, we think of ourselves as narrators, we, we're conduits. When yeah. we read a description of a beautiful meadow, something is happening to people's minds who listen to that. And not only does their mind respond to that, but their body, every single cell in their body resonates with that description. Yeah. We, words can literally transform people's physiology and the physiology can transform their actions. So if we it's say a big words, responsibility encouragement that can help people hurt we can hurt people through that yeah. and we can heal people and it's up to us how we want to use that it's literally it is magic it is magic and that's what you do too through your series i looked at your series of all the interviews with all the colleagues that you've talked about and their combined wisdom you've put that out into the world and that reaches people that changes them, transforms them, and it becomes a ripple effect of goodness, of kindness, of transformation. And that's oh, the magic of what you do. And I, want I to love that. that. I want that to be true. I want people to watch the shows and feel strong in themselves. And just because we get to play in this like amazing, we get to do this thing that like, and most people couldn't even dream about this when they were kids because they couldn't even imagine this would be something. And we're, we get to do it. Mm -hmm. Like, yes. And it's I, awesome. I, was, I studied hypnotherapy for a while and I'm a, I'm, I'm a trainer of hypnotherapy as well. And I believe that we as a narrator develop a hypnotic relationship with our listeners because what, what are we, what else are we doing? then give people suggestions. That's what a hypnotherapist does too. And people respond to the suggestion. Now, some people are more suggestible than others, but we cannot not communicate and not give suggestions that 
bring something about that changes people's mindset, changes people's state, and therefore every cell in their body resonates with them. And that's a big responsibility, but it's a beautiful responsibility too, because you know, I love watching hypnotherapists at work, how literally people can take those suggestions and transform how people behave and what they think about themselves. That's the power that we have. It's a yeah, tremendous I, power. I do thrillers and horrors, so I'm mostly scaring people, but still. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully well, in a good you know, way. <laughs> yeah, you can help people overcome their fears too. I mean, if I listen to yes. Danielle, read that book, I can listen to anything. I mean, we want to... But that's part of life too, I think. We want these thrill rides to make life yeah. exciting. Because sometimes life is boring and we seek out these things. And there's there's always this weird thing. There's this dark side of us too. And I always wonder what it is that we want to explore it. But it's entertainment, you know, it's distraction. And we need distraction too, because distraction can be healing as well. Yeah. Let's face it, life in itself is tough. And we don't always want to be following the news. We want to have some, some entertainment to some people. That's why will. people watch true crime shows on TV, because, yeah. you know, watching someone else's life implode makes you feel a little bit better about that bill. Yes, thank goodness it's not me. <laughs> exactly. Yes, I know. Yeah. This has been a wonderful and well-timed for me talk. This has just been inspiring. And I'm so happy that your story was a happy ending because because there's a lot out there that's like kind of concerning and worrying and it was just lovely paul's okay all's well with the world <laughs> we're in good hands <laughs> please keep writing your posts um we love it everyone another voice highly highly recommended if you haven't read it paul's book what was, can you please give the full Making title? It's, money in your PJs. But there's more Making to it, isn't there? PJs. And what I want to say is, you know, I see, I've seen so many questions come up on the screen. I'm going to send you uh, the chat as well so you can see yes, it. Yes, that'd be, that'd be super. Yes. And uh, I can't answer all of them, of course, but if you reach out to me through my website, there's a contact page and, and you, can, you can find me anywhere. If you type in Nether Voice, you'll find me somehow, somewhere. I'll do my very best to reach out to you and answer any questions that you may have. Because like I said, you know, if you have knowledge and you don't share it, it's worth zilch, nothing, nada, nothing. So I'd be happy to share it and, and deal with your questions. I'll send you the chat. Time. Most of it is just them saying how much they love you. So. <laughs> I love you too. <laughs> Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you everyone for joining. It's been a wonderful day where you are evening for me. I hope you have a wonderful time and the video will be out in two weeks. Bye everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.